Way right now. Um, hi, my name is Dave Bloniers, and I'm with the U.S. Forest Service in Amherst, Massachusetts. And uh, we're very excited to present today's uh, iTree workshop on iTree um, as the ins and outs of tree inventories. And we have some great panelists, and hopefully, we can get some questions answered for you uh, today on some of the enhancements and where we're at with um, the iTree related to tree inventories. I just kind of go through a couple things. We're using um, Zoom, which is our platform for conferencing. And you'll see two components. One is up in the top right is a full screen icon. And, and you might want to click that. And that will allow you to uh, see the uh, slides or the web uh, sharing in, in full size. Um, and to get out of that, you just hit escape. And then down at the bottom, we have a chat button. And then that's the area where you should be able to uh, type in your questions or um, for us that we'll answer at uh, opportune times and we try to get to everybody as we go through. Um, and uh, Jason, I think you're typing, you gotta mute your line, I think, because you're doing the other things. Um, and then uh, today what we have, and I'm gonna turn this over in a second, over to uh, Krista, we have Krista Heinlein from the Davy Institute and the U.S. Forest Service, our, our partnership, which is really responsible for helping us pull iTree together. Jason Henning, again, with the Davy Institute and uh, Forest Service. And Al, who exclusively is, is um, um, one of the uh, Davy Institute uh, premier team members. So what we uh, want to do is we have about an hour. I'm going to turn everything over to uh, um, Krista for her presentation. But if you do have any questions or uh, need help, raise your hand or chat and we'll follow up with that. Okay, thanks for joining. Thanks, Dave. That sounds great. Um, and just by way of a quick introduction, this is Krista Heinlein. I'm with the Davy Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, and first off, uh, really glad to see so many of you able to join us today for what is our final webinar of 2017. And what we're going to talk about today, um, as Dave uh, mentioned, we're going to talk about the ins and outs of inventories, but most specifically, the kinds of things that you might want to think about. Uh, when you're using iTree for your tree surveys, as well as for your benefits analysis, uh, many of you are revisiting, um, uh, you know, we, many of you are eco-users, many of you are also familiar with iTree Streets, which is also, um, uh, you know, was prior to eco, our primary uh, tool for tree surveys. And what we want to do is revisit this, not so much as a how-to kind of session, uh, but really, you know, what are some of the things that you want to be thinking about? What are some of your big picture and ultimate outcome object objectives when you're considering a survey uh, and the use of iTree to do your inventory analysis? And many of you also uh, are very familiar with Al Zelaya, who's going to run our webinar today. He's probably um, talked to many of you about using eco and knows the ins and outs um, pretty much as well as anybody. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and let him take over. Um, and as Jason mentioned, as you, if you guys have questions, uh, you guys are more than welcome and actually encouraged to go ahead and place them in the webinar chat window. Um, if there are appropriate moments to go ahead and talk about some of these questions as we're moving along, uh, we may take those opportunities, but at the very least, we're going to go ahead and address anyone's questions um, as best we can at the end. And then we'll talk a little bit about the things that we'll see coming down the pike for January. Uh, so again, thanks again, thanks to everyone for being here and Al, take it away. Thank you, Krista. Thanks for setting that up. And so here's how I just wanted to set things up for today. This was somewhat of a, a blank slate. So I wanted to just start with a little bit about the overall objective, just to reiterate what Krista said, is, is not so much to go into a how to use streets or eco. And at the end, I asked Jason to talk about some of the resources that we actually have available 
uh, that go into great detail, some of the videos that can walk you through how to set up a project, how to use a mobile data collection, and so on. Uh, more so today, what I wanted to focus on is decision making. And that's where I'm going to try to stay a little bit above that uh, level of just looking at these, comparing these two application streets, eco, where they're at, and how I go about using these tools and how I you know, make recommendations to folks when they come across that intersection. And one of the things that you know, people, even on our team, are wondering, why are we talking about tree inventories? For the past 10 years that I've been working with iTree, we, we try to define ourselves differently. We're not tree inventory tools or tree analysis tools, benefit analysis tools. But when we ask our users, how do you use iTree, this is what they tell us. So in the real world, um, people are trying to get stuff done. And iTree is a set of tools. And how you adapt those tools and use those tools is really up to you. So it's in our interest if we can help you. If we can help you use these tools and make better decisions, then you can advance along with the urban and community forestry program. And so we'll start with a little bit on the basics and just kind of move into the tools and I'll try to give you an example of how I kind of tie things together. But just going back to where tree inventories stand and they've been around a lot longer than iTree. And I also go back to the old Bob Miller book. And I know there's a newer edition, but um, this is kind of what I, I always use as the foundation. Management of any resource begins with an inventory of the resource. And, and so that really is the cornerstone of an inventory, many reasons why you'd want that too and, and why it's beneficial to programs. And so, you know, know thy resource, understand it so you can make better management decisions, whether that has to do with reducing risk, uh, plan healthcare issues, mon monitoring for pests and disease types things. Uh, and then using that information to prioritize work that's needed, whether it's pruning, removals, and so on, and then tracking that work through time. So many different reasons why inventories are a, valu a valuable tool. And then even going beyond that, not just knowing what you have, but what's possible. So things like stocking, really things like available planting spaces where you don't have trees, but could have trees as valuable information for future planning and management, budgeting, and so on. Things like evaluating the level of services and maintenance that's required to manage the resource too is also something that you can use uh, or make better decisions if you have inventory information. And all that information is used to develop plans of action or reinforce management plans or other plans, sustainability plans and so on, climate action plans integrating in uh, your urban force into those more advanced planning uh, type situations. And more recently, what we see is people who are actually making use of inventory for outreach and advocacy. So connecting the tree resource with the community. How can you share that information? So many new opportunities and iTree probably has helped build that bridge a little bit more so. But we all, I also think of iTree as a tremendous management tool too. It just provides a lot of good information about structure. We'll talk a little bit more about that which really drives the benefits that trees provide. So how does tree inventory, we've established that as a, an entity of information about the tree resource, the physical tree resource, what are the tree species, the size of the species, the diameter, uh, the canopy information if available, the condition, the health of those trees, where are they in the landscape, how are they distributed? What areas are they growing? Are they growing in parks? Are they growing in four by four? Um, cutouts in concrete all affects tree health and also the benefits that trees provide. So that piece is the tree inventory. And that's what we need to tie into iTree. So I think of these, you know, we often talk about structure, function, value. If you've heard any iTree presentation, this is just looking at the same thing, but in terms of pieces of a puzzle that feed each other. So we don't really care how you come about getting that information on structure. If that's on a piece of paper, if that's in an application, if that's in a really sophisticated GIS management system, we just need that information and we can use that in iTree. So iTree is really the engine that will use that tree information, the 
tree structure information, and then use that in models to determine how that tree is interacting in its environment, local pollution, local weather, other environmental variables to produce estimates of air quality improvement or how much stormwater is being intercepted or avoided in runoff, and carbon sequestration, energy effects. What I like to call the big four. There are a lot more now, especially with the iTree Eco model. So that's how the pieces sort of go together. And then the model will provide value estimates. So what are the monetary values based on some of the economic models that we have available, such as a social cost of carbon or other economic models that determine what is a, an estimate, say, for a gallon of stormwater managed based on some regional information that may be available. And, and then also in some cases, what is a structural or replacement cost, the physical cost of that resource. So those are how those pieces somewhat go together. So iTree in itself, we need data. We need data for the model. And so that's why there are protocols in those applications that allow for basic tree inventory collection or importing in existing tree inventory data. So just to looking at these a little bit side by side, tree inventories and what I'm calling iTree analysis or benefit analysis, who's using these? And tree inventories, that can vary. So it depends on cities. Many cities are very particular because they're managing for risk and they want city staff or professional consultants to conduct those. But if they don't have resources, then they work with other groups to get that done. iTree, we really see a, a wide variety of users because it's, it goes beyond just government consultant use, nonprofit organizations will use it quite a bit students, academic researchers, and volunteer groups. So we have more of, of a wider base, but we feed into that same, uh, same entity, the municipal and county and governments who actually are doing more of the on the ground day-to-day -day management of public resources. Many different ways that the data can be brought into iTree, so complete inventory, sample, or partial are what we usually see for tree inventories, and that holds true with iTree, we can use the same data. Again, that's, that's what drives the model, is we need the data. And, and that's one of, again, the best ways to use iTree is taking what's existing, external, and bringing it in by an import process. So where, where are most of these tree inventories? Where we see those mostly are from street trees and park trees. Campuses will have those. Some institutions may have tree inventories for managing the resource. And, and in iTree, early on when I first started working with the, the tools and the team, we were more focused on that municipal user base. But over time, we've expanded to all land. So the initial tools, U4 and Stratum, which really tied in very well with municipal government, now we want to be able to engage homeowners, county planners, watershed managers, and so on. And, and not just in the U.S., but everywhere. So it's, it's a... a an all lands approach to iTree tools. And frequency is another question. How often do you update inventories? And that too varies. And so uh, I recall some of the, the better well-run managed programs, well-funded programs, maybe every five years or so updating inventories. But in the real world, uh, that just doesn't happen. And, and things unfold and we're lashed for economic downturns. And so there are many communities, especially in the Midwest, that are now just getting back after a decade to finally getting back to updating inventories and, and going back to proactive management. So that's what we're seeing now is a lot of the communities that had to deal with an economic downturn, other issues like managing emerald ash borer, had to focus a tremendous amount of time and resources to dealing with that and they're just now getting back to a lot of updating of regular maintenance and, and, and updating inventories and management plans. iTree analysis, that varies also too. And, and that too really just depends on the, the way that users use the data. So often what we see with some of the larger scale eco projects, maybe updated every 10 years. But now the tools that iTree has that is available with the eco import option Anytime you update a tree inventory, you pretty much can update, update the iTree analysis and it's just a little bit of a process to do. So the frequency may change, but generally 
since you're measuring change over time, it, it's not as often. Free inventories, that's more of a dynamic tool if you're using it for asset management or planning. And so staying on top of that's a little bit more critical, especially if it's um, tracking work and risk management and so forth. But it is challenging for, for most government agencies. So the why part and, and asset management and planning are kind of the foundation pieces with tree inventories. Where an iTree also dovetails well with that. We, we think of it as a tool for advising management also, but then again, allowing management to become more strategic. So understanding what the resource is providing in terms of benefits allows you to make decisions based on those benefits that are most desired to a community. So things like uh, resiliency planning, climate adaptation strategies, what are those resources and benefits that trees are providing that are gonna be most critical to people protecting property? So you can be a lot more strategic with your decision-making, dovetailing iTree with your regular asset management and planning. And then there's advocacy and research also too. So many different reasons why folks will use iTree. In both inventories and iTree analysis, a lot of the same type of ways of getting data into the interface and using that. So eco or streets, that brings us to the intersection of these two applications. And this is always somewhat of a tricky question to answer. And we tend to look at things as very one way. So streets for street trees, eco for everything else. I see tools based on what is the objective. What are you trying to do? How are you going to use the data? And then what are the tools that I have in my box that might best help you get to your objective? So I, I don't see them as black and white, more or less as gray, but needing some things to help me make decisions. Information. Side by side, very similar though. If you, if you look at these tools, eco, and streets, but very different models. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So I set this up just so if you look at what are the minimum data requirements. And in the past streets, well streets has always worked with species and DBH, and then you have options of other information if you have available. Eco on the other hand, up until recent, uh, when, er when Eco V6 came out, had much more data requirements. But what we wanted to do is make Eco V6 more accessible to folks. So we made the requirements the same as streets. So species DBH is a minimum requirement for Eco. So the idea is that Eco is this dynamic model. So when I think of Eco, I think of something that's dynamic, it's adaptable, it's comprehensive, and it's a local model. So it's a much more robust model. And it provides really an extensive amount of benefit ecosystem service modeling and a number of different new things that are being added. I think Mike Binkley just emailed us and said that there's now gonna be, I believe maybe pollution modeling for grass and crops, which is something that uh, folks have asked for for a long time. So that might be something that we'll see in, in future updates. Uh, whereas streets is a, a static model. It's a regional model. It's based on research that was done in 16 reference cities. When I think of streets, I think of it as a very useful tool, but it's limited, but it's simple. And so that's why people still like that tool and use that. But some of the same things, there are some differences though. So you notice there's GPS option, which is available for data collection for streets, not available for Eco V6 right now. That's something that's still on the, uh, the list to do. Eco is adaptable for international use. So that has a wider base of users across the world. Some of the maintenance information that we used to have in streets and still do is now available and being integrated into Eco. Newer modules like forecasting are now also in Eco. So streets as it's always been will always be that way. And there'll probably come a time where we won't be updating streets in terms of how it works at operating systems. So when I look at those two tools, and these are just some of the things that I consider when, when would I use Eco? So if I'm doing an inventory, if ecosystem services are my primary goal, that's the information that's paramount to me, is getting that, that information. 
Then I want to use the more robust model, which uses local data. You can see here, this is set up for Springfield, Massachusetts. I have a whole selection of using pollution from 2005 to 2013, and I can select from three locations right around that city of Springfield. Whereas if I were using streets, I would be using regional data for the Northeast. If you have existing tree inventory data, then I now recommend iTree Eco. The import process for Eco, and, and I'm, I think Jason would agree with me, is much easier than streets. It used to take me days sometimes to format streets, iTree streets data, and get that into iTree streets. I don't think there's ever anything that I haven't been able to get into Eco in, in literally more than, say, a, a half day without doing any type of reformatting. So reporting outputs by individual tree is something too that's very nice and eco. So this is for the folks who are doing things for outreach, Arbor Day, making up uh, signs or, or think how much benefits a tree is providing. Eco reports benefits by individual trees also and summarizes things by species and strata, whereas streets doesn't do that. Streets just summarizes benefits by species. So it's a little bit harder to get at that information if, you, if that's something that you're interested in. International projects, definitely eco here again. That, that model is, uh, we've had many new cities being added. The iTree database offers a way to integrate new information into the model. And if you're interested in monitoring change over time, a lot of people wanna use um, comparisons to see how things are changing. Is management effective? What, what have our decisions plans and actions shown and is our resource providing more benefits today than it was five years ago. So ECO is going to be a robust model that will be able to help you get at that information where streets will be a little bit more difficult to do things like that because it's not going to change. It's going to use the same pollution um, weather data that it's always used. So when would I use streets then? I, I, I pretty much uh, built the case why ECO is such a, a better robust model to use, but yet we still have streets on the shelf available to use, and I use it all the time. Truth be told, the reason why is simplicity. So again, when I'm evaluating somebody's objectives or resources, the folks that they have, how can they get to the finish line? Sometimes the simplest option will get me through to the finish line much easier. Things like GPS still matter to folks who are interested in mapping. So there's some uh, utility there that we don't have yet in ECO. And then some of the other things that Streets has that have not been integrated into ECO yet, like available planting spaces, street segment sampling. In those cases, Streets still might be a tool that might work better for you. And the other reason where I tend to use streets is if I'm just interested in getting raw inventory, if I want to bring that into mapping or in some other tool, I just need something to get raw data. Sometimes streets is a little bit of an easier tool to use, especially for folks who are beginners. And if you're using streets, you have to accept that it's static. It's not changing. It's not being updated. And at some point, you might have to consider taking your data and migrating that into ECO if you want to do any further ecosystem analysis. So a couple other things to consider. Uh, again, I keep reiterating that the low-hanging fruit is now importing in any type of existing data. So it doesn't really matter what you have. It's, it's very easy to get data into iTree Eco especially. And maybe I should temper that because it, there are some challenges for folks who are trying to force IDs to uh, maintain. So if they want to try to tie in existing data and match up benefits for that data. And the example of the picture I, I have up on the screen is from Weight Arboretum in South Australia and I remember working with them, it was, it's very difficult, it's a little bit tricky if you're trying to maintain IDs that you have and bring them in to ECO. If you have any type of data issues, it, it tends to make it a little bit more challenging. But we were able to do it in the end, and they were then able to match up the benefit information and tie that to their existing ArcGIS inventory. Now they have a public-facing 
engagement tool that they can use to tie in tree benefit information with the trees at the Arboretum. So, so that's one of the things and why I kind of wanted to bring that into play is that we're not so much interested in asset management as getting at the ecosystem services with iTree. So there are going to be some little challenges that you might encounter. I'm not going to do a lot on data collection today just because I'm very limited in time what we can present in this uh, format, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so. But the, the options are the same for streets, eco, and, and people still use paper, mobile data collection, which is something that you can use on a smartphone or tablet is another option and just direct data entry into the applications works either way too. One of the common questions that uh, comes up to, and we, we can talk about this maybe in the discussion, is people are always interested in trying to tie in their inventory into iTree and then directly into an online presentation, such as what I have here with the Weight Arboretum. There is no simple way of doing that just because of the complexity of iTree Eco with numerous uh, underlying tables and relation relationships that are built into those tables. And just the model itself makes it incredibly difficult for somebody just to take external data, have that route into iTree and spit benefits back and populate your online GIS maps instantly. So that that is not something that is a capability that we can handle right now at least. So some of the lessons learned that I, I did want to share with folks, and, and this just goes from helping folks over the past decade make these decisions, whether it's uh, in many small communities. That's usually one of the challenges for small communities, how can, how can we get the work done? We don't have the resources. City of Milwaukee doesn't call me for help. I call them for help usually. How, can, how do you guys do this? And then I can share that with other folks. But it's all the smaller communities that, um, that don't have those resources or the expertise on staff. And so they're the ones that you learn quite a bit from. How did they get that done? And how, did, how do they get out of the ditch when they uh, unfortunately ended up in a ditch? And many times people come back to us and say, boy, I wish I would have thought more about having uh, zones. I wish I would have had GPS information because now I'd like to map my data. So those are the things that we tell folks, think about that carefully when you're at that initial point of project planning and management, uh, how do you want to use that data? Consider the time, the resources, the skills. And again, going back, these are just tools that I have available to me that you have available to you. What can you realistically accomplish? You might not be able to do the whole city. Can you do part of the city? Logistics, getting from across the city, things like that all matter when you're trying to make something achievable and build momentum. I often say a pilot project to me is my favorite place to start. Do something small, learn from that, build upon that. So considering those things early on were some of the, the things that folks came back to us. Understanding and testing the process, cradle to grave. So, so here again, I, I've had a, and Jason and, and Erica and Krista and others and Robbie may, may have come across this too, where somebody will say, hey, I've been collecting data on this iPad for the whole summer. What do I do now? And all of a sudden, my palms start sweating and my neck hairs stand up because I don't know that that data is going to be there for three months that you've been collecting. So knowing how that data moves from the field to the server to the applications, practicing that, going through that with your data collectors, so that you can manage that and fix any issues so folks know it'll just make your project go that much more smoother. Training, setting up people to, to make better decisions and understand. So that's all time well spent and invested. What are the things that you can give them? Maps, guides, measurement tools, metadata so that they understand and can make decisions in the field and so that you have consistency with your data. QA, QC, quality, checking data to see for issues also. So those two are things that um, have come back. Boy, I wish I would have gone back and checked the species that uh, crew A was collecting because they had, they were collecting something incorrect and now I've got to go back and fix all that data. If I would have gotten out there early or reviewed with them, we could have set them on the um, straight path where they're making better decisions and 
proper identification calls. So that, that starts with quality checking. And so that's something that's um, time consuming, but it's necessary and in the long run it'll pay off. And again, considering how that data will be used. So oftentimes I've seen folks do things and then they'll present it to the city and then the city will come back and say, boy, can you tell me how things look between these different zones? Or can you give me this other information? Did you capture this data about trees? It's too late then. So that's one of the things that if you have examples and you can use the sample projects or you can talk to us uh, for examples of what other cities have used and then show that to who you might be sharing the data with. If you're working with a city, if you're working with a park, what information is of value? And so think about that early on and then even going forward and how you might use that. And, and to me, data isn't interesting. I mean, it, it is if you're, I'm a bit of a data nerd just because that's all I deal with day in and day out. But turning that into a story is, is where it gets to be somewhat compelling and it becomes something impactful too. So thinking how you can use that data just beyond the, the information for asset management and planning to connect with the community is, is an opportunity. So that's just a, a little bit about kind of the procedures that I go through with uh, thinking about how they're just tools that we have available with limitations and advantages and how I use those to, to make decisions and help others make decisions. So what I wanted to do now is do a little bit of an exploration. And then again, a story makes for a more interesting um, way of looking at this. And so this is something that we did with Dave Bloniers actually in the city of Springfield. I'll show I'll try to show you how I tied all these different things together. I'm not sure I can get to the finish line with this, but we'll, we'll try. So this was a class that we were doing with Dave and a small group of folks, citizen science. And so they were interested in working on learning on either becoming employed in a green industry. So working for uh, tree care companies or starting their own companies or also helping with research projects or helping the local nonprofits in Springfield, Massachusetts. And so we wanted to start teaching them basic skills. So again here, new folks and they were folks from underserved communities. So limited resources that they had available too, limited time. And we were going to start out doing a small inventory project across the street, street from our, our, our our classroom at UMass in downtown Springfield. So that's what I wanted to try to do. And that's the map that we started with. And so what we decided to do in this case again, so I've got streets or eco. Simplicity was my paramount thing that I used here. And that's what I wanted to do. All we wanted to do was teach them how to evaluate trees, tree ID, collect some data. And I wanted to get at the raw data so that we could do other things with that. So I'm going to end the slideshow and then I'll show you a little bit about the, the applications and how that looked, some of the tools that I used. So one of the things with project planning and I'll open up streets here. Is you have to decide, I'm not going to go through the whole process of project configuration, but you decide what you want to collect in any inventory. And in iTree Streets, it has a very simple dialogue that allows you to set up the information that you want to collect. And so for us, for our small project that we were doing in that park, we broke it down into zones just so that we can use zones. And we just had simple DBH that we we're collecting condition. We were just using all the basic defaults here. And we had some streets that we could pull down if we wanted to use those. Uh, we had a way to designate if, there, if a tree was a multi-step. So not that much information. There's a couple other options that you have available. This is one of the nice flexibility options at iTree Streets, but also Eco has now too. One of the other things that you'll see is maintenance. So if these are things that you are interested in capturing, you can do that and they're all customizable. 
So what you see here is also available in Eco2. But this was more of just a learning project, so we weren't really interested in trying to make uh, too many of these determinations as to you know, what are the maintenance requirements for these, although we were doing some uh, identification of plant health care issues in the field. So that's just a simple way that when you go through iTree streets, create a project, that's where you make those primary decisions. That's where you decide, am I going to collect information in zones or in eco, am I going to stratify projects? So, so those are the things that you will inevitably find yourself going back and updating early on because you may have forgotten something or somebody wants something else new in there that you didn't have. Other things that are nice in here with iTree Streets, which we don't have in Eco, is just the ability to define species on the fly easily. So they're available almost instantly. And so this is somewhat flexible, but it's a limited list also. So Eco has about 7,000 different trees. This is a regional model and you're gonna find maybe 150 to 200 trees available and, and not everything you'll find in your streets or in your cities are going to be on these lists. And in most cases, you can use a, uh, a reasonable representation in here. The other thing too, as I mentioned, is that you can create stocking too. So this is where you can do things if you wanted to add in available planting spaces capture stumps that need to be ground. So this tool, iTree Streets, has a lot of utility for capturing information for management. Much has been integrated into iTree Eco, but not everything in here. So a lot of flexibility uh, in this particular tool. Data entry is very simple too with this one. And this is what the data look like that we eventually brought in here. Only 37 trees, very doable to capture out there. One of the reasons we use iTree Streets too is so that we could collect GPS information. So although most of our team was just collecting data on pen and paper because it was easy or it was easier to focus on that, Dave and I were collecting information using a smartphone so that we could have the GPS coordinates. Again, so it's all I wanted here was the raw data. So what's nice with this though is that you still, if you have that inventory information, you then have access to the benefit information. So nice thing with streets is that it has those same core benefits of energy, carbon, air quality, stormwater, and it also has an aesthetic value. So that is somewhat of streets in a nutshell, but really again here, the information that I wanted was just the records. So we got our data, we learned how to collect some data, we learned how to evaluate some issues with trees. So we saw things, uh, you know, common things, trees planted too deep, girdling roots and so forth. We've got all that information and then I can export out this data into a spreadsheet to do with whatever I wanna do. So this is what I wanted to get at. And now this is, this is what I look at as my inventory. So this is my living, inventory that I can do. I can add in fields if there's information. I can sort out things if I wanted to. This is what I wanted to get at here for this particular exercise with this group. And now if I really want to use that information, I could bring that into eco then. So now that's the second phase. So all I did was use streets to collect data very simply with a new group of students learning how to do data collection. It's a, it's a very simple process, but now I could bring that into ECO, and there's much more I could do in ECO. So this is looking at ECO now. Now I'm opening up ECO, so hopefully you're still following along and it's not too much shifting around. But you can see it looks very similar. So it's the same data, and I'm, I'm not gonna go through the import process. Jason will talk about where those resources are. But all I did was import that same data into ECO. You can see ECO has a little bit more complexity to it. There's a number of DBHs, and that's so that it can handle multi-stem trees, but it really is the same type of information. Small variations, ECO uses percent dieback as a proxy for tree health. So it's a matter of crosswalking that in, and a lot of the same information, comments, that's all still there. 
Project configuration, just to show you the, how that looks in Eco, it's very much the same. It has a, what I like to call a dashboard or a panel that allows you to set up, again, the same things as in Streets. So if you're interested in collecting maintenance information in Eco, you can do that too. So sure, we could have used this initially for that project, but then I wouldn't be able to capture those GPS coordinates. So that was one of the things that I wanted to do, and it was just more of an easier tool for me to manage with a new group of people. But we could have definitely used this tool also. It was just a little bit more limiting for what I was trying to accomplish initially. And one of the reasons why I wanted the information in a spreadsheet is so that then we can also do some mapping exercises just to show folks, again, what is possible with taking that spreadsheet data and using interfaces like Google My Maps. So a lot of folks are really interested in how can I share that data. One of the challenges with iTree is that we only have GPS information. So it does not come out that accurate. When you zoom in here and you see how these trees are laid out, that's not really where they're at. So that center tree is my sweet gum, which I think might be this tree right here. So that's off. But you can change these. And, and so as long as you're managing a project, you can update these trees to the proper location too. And so it was just an exercise to see what's possible. And then when it's all corrected, this is what it actually looks like. So now I can see my pear trees in a row and some of the other trees where they actually are. And in this interface too, you can add in pictures. So if you wanna see different pictures, you can tie things in, look at the resource, uh, tar spot on maple. So all things like this to help folks learn plant healthcare. And this is easy too. Uh, it's a nice way too. So if you wanted to share work that needs to be done with somebody else. So again, going back to the data is what I'm trying to get at. How am I going to use that data is, is my end game. And then this was what I wanted to do. So I can use iTree streets, capture data, take that data, bring it into mapping if I'd like. And then also if I want to get at some really sophisticated ecosystem service modeling, bring that into iTree Eco. So <laughs> three different phases with a very simple 37 tree inventory project. And, and you can see this is, you know, all these different outputs are now available in Eco. So that's somewhat of a way that I kind of use all these different learning tools and inventory tools to, to tie things together. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jason now because everything that I talked about is actually very doable. And what I just showed you bringing data into uh, iTree Eco, again, an import process is very simple. Setting up projects in Eco, Erica Teach put together a number of videos on that too. And so that's something that uh, we have some very nice, simple tools and manuals that can help you if you want to actually try these. So I'll, I'll turn that over to Jason now to kind of walk folks to resources and hopefully we'll have time for uh, questions. Hey, Al, can you hear me now? I muted myself in three different places after Dave yelled at me, so let me know. Yeah, Al, I we mean, got you, Jason. Jason. We got you. I don't, I don't yell at anyone. Just <laughs> guess. All right. Let me share my screen here real quick. So, yeah, uh, I just want to say as I go to share my screen here that there's been some really good questions in the uh, – chat too as we've gone through and uh, Al may not even be aware of this but uh, one of our developers let us know that the GPS will be added to iTree Eco um, by the end of 2018 uh, so by this time next year uh, you will be able to collect those GPS coordinates in, in uh, Eco the same as you can in streets uh, so hopefully you can see my screen and I'm, I just have our uh, website up there 
And I just wanted to point out a few resources, and these may help answer a few questions that we had in the chat too that I wasn't able to get to or uh, answer them a little more specifically as well. Um, and one of the big ones that I want to point to right off the top uh, is if you're using the software and you're not sure how to do something, whether it's how to get to mobile data collection or how to import data, uh, we've put together a bunch of videos to try to answer those questions. And you can now get to those right on the homepage. This is www.itreetools.org. Uh, under training here, um, there is the video learning resources. So you can get to a whole bunch of videos there. And we also have them under the resources tab up here uh, under video learning. So I'll just pop that open real quick. Um, and we try to cover everything that we think people run into trouble with a, a lot of the time. So uh, there's just some real introduction videos here. There are some of the other tools. So if you're interested in other tools besides iTree Eco or Streets, uh, those are on there too. Uh, but you can see under Streets, we have a whole series of video. Um, there's 10 videos here that essentially walk you through the entire process of uh, setting up a project, collecting data, uh, looking at results, uh, using mobile field, uh, data collection system. Everything's in there start to finish. Uh, we also then have a series of videos that just walk through tree inventory data import. So if you already have data and want to get it in the streets, it's there. Um, and then if you want to try and map this, we just have a real quick video that goes through how you can get your GPS coordinates out and use them in uh, free software like Google's My Maps or uh, QGIS to look at a map of your iTree Streets data. Uh, we also then have a series of iTree Eco videos that kind of parallel the same uh, sort of structure, talk about some of what's new. We've got a series about how to import. And you'll notice that this is just one video for Eco because it's a, a whole lot easier to do that import as Al mentioned in Eco. Uh, so it uh, only takes one video there um, and a whole lot of videos. We even have some videos under the Eco about how to do field data collection and uh, Dave Blonier has had a hand in some of these. So uh, if you want to know how to establish a plot outside, uh, when you're actually looking at trees, um, same thing with some individual tree measurements. All that stuff uh, is under that video learning. Uh, and it's also on a YouTube page. So if you'd rather do this directly from YouTube or uh, sign up for a YouTube channel, uh, you can get to that here. Um, and that looks something like this. And it's just the same exact videos. So if you clicked on videos here, you could look at a whole bucket of everything we have. Um, or we've got these various playlists. So this is just the Eco version six, all those videos. This is that iTree Streets basic training. So the 10 part series that walks through iTree Streets start to finish. Uh, and again, some of the other tools are in there as well. Uh, so all that stuff is online, whether you like YouTube or whether you like getting it from the iTree uh, website. Uh, those videos have really uh, been well received and we get a lot of positive feedback and we're always happy to make more. So if you run into a problem, uh, setting up your project or uh, working with iTree Eco or Streets, let us know. And if it's something we hear a lot about or we think other people can learn from, we'll make a video. Uh, if you don't like videos, if you like uh, other sorts of manuals, we also have those too. So under the resources here, if you want some uh, manuals you can print out, uh, there's this manuals and workbooks. Uh, we can jump to that and you'll see here we have Eco version 6, a whole series of manuals that cover uh, pretty much anything you would ever want to do. If you need a manual for out in the field about how to measure trees and plots, that's there. The user's manual for working with the software uh, and so on. Um, there's a few workbooks for creating uh, projects using ArcGIS, how to lay out your plots and those sorts of things. Uh, some of those are, are a little bit dated, some of that's a little easier to do within Eco now, and that's covered in uh, some of these manuals up here, especially those about stratifying. Um, so if you like paper, and you want paper manuals, paper walkthroughs, uh, all that stuff is under that manuals and workbooks in the resources tab. Um, if you want to go beyond that and you want to know how iTree works or uh, you want some uh, specific data collection sheets, we have some of those too. Uh, and all that is collected in our archives. So again, I'm just here at resources, archives, and this is kind of the big bucket of everything related to uh, the underlying models and how the models work. But there's also some useful stuff for project planning as well. So uh, under the Eco V6 resources, um, and I think I put some of these links actually in the chat a little earlier, uh, if you want a data collection sheet, 
plot data collection sheet, tree data collection sheet. These are just spreadsheets and Word docs that you can edit uh, so that you can have a paper data collection sheet to take out with you. Uh, if you want the whole eco species list, that's in there as well. If you want some of the methods about how these things work, if you're really ready to dig into those, uh, a lot of the, that documentation, including the uh, peer-reviewed publications, are under these other resources tabs. Uh, we have another one for streets down here, and it's the same sort of structure. If you want to know how streets works, there's these reference city field guides, but we also have a data collection sheet. Uh, we also have all the species codes for streets in there as well. So there's lots and lots in the archives here, but some of those specific pieces uh, might be of interest to some folks who uh, had questions earlier and who are on the line. Uh, so that's the videos, the manuals and workbooks and the archives. And at some point you'll probably want to report out on some of this stuff. So if you want to see what other folks have done, we have some of that as well. So we have project profiles and project reports. And pretty much anytime anybody provides us with a, an interesting report or the Forest Service puts out a, an interesting city report, we'll put it up here on the website so the other users can uh, see what those look like and benefit from those. There's some really brief ones by Casey Trees. So if you're looking for just something like a air pollution brochure and you want to see something they put together, we have some of those. But then we also have some really big uh, citywide projects in here, uh, like the London Report and uh, other large iTree Eco projects. So it sort of runs the gamut and you can look through there and see if there's anything that fits your needs or that's similar to the type of thing uh, that you would like to do. Uh, we also sometimes highlight some of those in our newsletters as well. Uh, so if you'd like to see uh, the newsletters, you can get to those. Um, and we have the project profiles as well, which will highlight some of those uh, interesting projects. But you can see under the newsletters tab, and this was under news, newsletters, you can get to uh, some of those projects as well if you want to see something we may have highlighted in a past newsletter, or if you just want to subscribe so you get future newsletters. I think we just sent one out uh, either late yesterday or early today. Uh, so hopefully, uh, if you didn't get one recently, you may want to subscribe there. Uh, and lastly, just if you ever need help, uh, you can always go to support. Uh, the users forum is a pretty useful place to go. We have a lot of uh, FAQs collected there. Uh, so there's uh, iTree official FAQs on all the different tools. So uh, someone may have asked the question you're asking before, and we'll have it up there. Um, and lastly, from support, if you just want to get in touch with us, you can always email us at uh, info at itreetools.org, and that's under this all support tab, uh, all the other support outlets if you ever need to get in touch with us. Uh, so with that, I think we have about five minutes left if we want to open it to uh, general questions and bring uh, Al and anyone else back on that uh, wants to help out with that. I think everybody can unmute themselves. Would that be okay for the uh, team that are the um, the panelists? And then I'm going to request remote control from you, Jason. And then I'll put up some other things while uh, folks are answering the questions. And I know uh, Mike Binkley is on. Um, Mike, we can try to make you a, if I can, it might have to be done by Chris or somebody. Um, make you able to uh, check in with us too. I'm going to allow you to talk. There you go. <laughs> Dave, I think we're actually in pretty good shape. I know that um, Jason did a pretty good job of handling most of the questions that came up in the chat window today. Um, and Mike Binkley is one of our developers who was letting us know that the 2018 time frame um, is for better and for worse as, as sort of close as we can get to identifying a schedule for those GPS capacities coming for ECO. Lots of good questions about that today and about how that is something that the streets accommodates. Um, and, you know, we're aware that that is, you know, a useful priority for uh, pulling into ECO. So, you know, all of this, the things that we talked about today were definitely in the interest of looking at some of those differences and some of the questions that we know users have as this, as the set of iTree functions continues to grow and continues to accommodate things like mobile data collection and and how do we incorporate those kinds of things with inventories that maybe you've done before or how are you going to put that in motion for your goals moving forward? Um, and I, I'm 
segueing here actually into, you know, since we've had so many of you join us today, which was fantastic, and Dave is going to let you know um, about how to stay connected with this webinar series in the future and how to sign up for your credits today um, if that's something you're interested in pursuing. Uh, our January session, our, our inaugural session for 2018, if you will, will take the form of a roundtable. Uh, we will have several of our iTree developers and support staff and users, frankly, together um, in an attempt to address some of the things that we're interested in presenting moving forward for the year. But it's also very much going to be centered on the types of things, questions like the ones that we got today about the things that will be most useful for users moving forward. And what are some of the things that you would like to see these webinars address? And how can we continue to address um, or put together those resources and those support systems so that iTree is meeting your needs as best it can. Um, but Dave, if you want to go ahead and close us out. Yeah, I'm just going to um, let everybody know, I, I, this is a great presentation. Thank you for the uh, panelists for uh, presenting and thanks for all the attendees that attended today. What I'll do is, um, Krista just um, alluded to our next session, so I will send you information to all today's attendees, plus um, we'll get the word out on this, but this is gonna be a very critical one. The ITRE um, uh, webinar team met the other day, and we really wanna see what um, the needs are that you're interested in, in having. So if you can join us in um, January 18th, if you put that in your books, that would be great. Um, today's webinar was re recorded, and also I've put up all of the, um, W that will be available a little bit later because I won't get the recording for a couple hours, but I'll try to post that later this afternoon or late, uh, by tomorrow morning. If you go to this website, it'll also have everybody's information plus a bunch of links on inventories and how to get to some of the things that we talked about today. I know we had questions from folks trying to uh, see if the PowerPoints were available. And what I'd suggest you do is just go to that page and uh, try to contact the individual presenter um because that's just something that uh that's their work so they would uh, have to uh, work with you to get that to you um but the recording is certainly available for viewing and download and then for the folks who uh, are interested in getting their recertification credits if you go to www.unri.org ceu the quiz is available um uh, i believe it's up there right now i think i put that up um uh, early this morning because um, I received the slides and I and, and I, we change the quiz every time to make sure because um, uh, it's very important that we keep the uh, certification um, uh, with ISA and SAF um, up to snuff so uh, if you do want to um, do that just go ahead I believe that's active right now and then the last thing I'll do is just I want to thank everybody for uh, really joining us today we had over 175 people attending, which is a great um, uh, attendance. And I, I, we hope we can get that plus more for our January session, which you can help to lead the way of where we go in 2018. So Krista, Jason, and Al, and Mike Binkley, um, and Robbie, thanks for uh, answering those questions for us. And we hope to see you in January.